So without further ado, let me introduce you to Jack Lessonberry. Thank you, thank you, Steve. My name is really Jim Lehrer. And uh, I wanna, this, this is all about truth and political advertising, which is kind of like um, military intelligence. But anyway, it's, uh, we're, we're going to be looking at a series of campaign ads, as Steve said. And we have two very distinguished <coughs> uh, analysts, people with a long history of watching politics and government in the state, to help us make sense of them. On my far left, not necessarily politically, is Lester Graham, who is a reporter from Michigan Radio. He heads up our investigative unit at Michigan Watch. He's a very distinguished journalist. He's been in journalism since 1925, 1985. <laughs> and he was, he was former, a lot of us remember him as a senior editor of the Environment Report. Next to him is Rick Haglund, who is uh, one of the more promiscuous journalists in the state, <laughs> and, uh, uh, which is the, our, our word for successful. He's, had a, he's covered Michigan business, economics, and government for many years. Uh, he currently works for, writes for, among other people, he had a long career with Booth newspapers. He writes for the Grand Rapids Press still, Crane's Michigan Business, Detroit Legal News, and Dome Magazine. And he's one of our official True Squad referees. Now what we're going to do is show a series of these ads, and uh, I'm going to ask both of them to comment on them. I may ask you folks what you think by a show of hands, but if you have some questions or thoughts, scribble them down or write them on your hand, as my students do before their test, and then we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. So the first ad, uh, the first ad has to do with Proposal 2. Now that's the proposal to uh, enshrine collective bargaining for both public and private, uh, public sector and private sector workers in the Michigan Constitution. And this is an ad put out by a group called Protect Our Jobs. So uh, who's in charge of? Yes, on Proposal 2 doesn't add any rights workers don't already have. It doesn't force people to join unions. It doesn't put a single worker into a union who isn't already in one. It doesn't require anyone to pay dues. Yes on 2 simply prevents those who want to eliminate working people's rights from being able to do it. Collective bargaining for wages, benefits, and pensions is an American right. Protect it. Vote yes on Proposal 2. Okay. Well, Rick... What do you think? First of all, did you like it, and are you going to give it a fair or foul? I, this is an ad that we reviewed, and I think we gave it a foul uh, for a couple of different uh, statements in there. One of them had to do uh, uh, right at, uh, up front. He said that this proposal doesn't give us any additional rights. Well, it really does because some of the some of some of the things that uh, public employees bargained for in the past were removed in legislation um, uh, under the Snyder administration uh, in the past year or so. So it would restore some of those things and, uh, you know, possibly uh, enhance some of the uh, bargaining rights that they now have. So uh, it was a little misleading uh, in that regard. Otherwise, I think it was probably, you know, pretty fair. Lester? Uh, as I recall, it, it actually got a technical foul. One of the points that they made at the Truth Squad was that uh, the ad said uh, nobody would have to be forced to join the union or pay union dues. But the fact is, even if you don't belong to the union, if you're part of the collective bargaining right. uh, group, you have to pay for that representation. Is that different than the situation now? <clears throat> it is not uh, different uh, as it is right now for private sector workers, but it, uh, I believe it is uh, different for public sector workers. Yeah, that's that's correct. <clears throat> How many of you folks think this ad was effective at making its case? Raise your hand if you do. Okay. How many of you think it wasn't apt to change anybody's mind? Slightly smaller group. All righty. Let's go on to the second ad, which is put uh, put out by an anti-proposal to group called Citizens Protecting Michigan's Constitution. When we send them off in the morning, we should be certain they're safe at school. But what if Proposal 2 passes? It would eliminate safety rules for school bus drivers. Worse, Proposal 2 could prohibit schools from removing employees with criminal records. That's dangerous for kids and terrifying for parents. Instead of just worrying about our kids' grades, we'll have to pray for their safety. Vote no on Proposal 2. We can't take the risk. 
that scary ad, what did you give that, Lester, a fair or a foul? I, I, I think that's a foul uh, because the local school boards make up the rules and bargain with the um, unions to decide what kind of rules they'll have for employees. And if they want background checks, it's an easy thing to bargain into a contract. Rick? The Truth Squad reviewed that one. I did not review that one personally, but I believe we actually said that that one was okay. Um, that it is, it's kind of a scary ad, and that's kind of what it was meant to do. But um, th there was some, you know, kind of splitting hairs and wording. A lot of the, a lot of the claims that it made, it said, well, it, this could happen. Well, it's true, it could, not necessarily would. Um, so I think f for for that reason, we basically said that that we did not assess a follow for this ad. Okay, I'm curious, how many of you would give that ad a follow? You're in the How many of you think it was fair and peachy keen? <laughs> Nobody. And by the way, just a little, uh, t a little commercial. I would like all of you to make sure you read the text of these proposals. They're often much different than portrayed by either side. For example, Proposal 2 does say that you can outlaw public employees striking, which uh, is not mentioned very often. And some of the other proposals have codicils that uh, aren't being broadcast. All righty. The next one we're going to look at, first of all, a couple ads having to do with Proposal 3. Now, that's the famous 25 by 25 amendment that would require Michigan utilities to get 25 percent of their electric power from renewable sources, wind, solar, hamsters on wheels, by uh, the year 2025. I made up the part about the hamsters. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is by a group called, uh, first one is called CARE, Clean, Affordable, Renewable Energy. Moving forward or falling behind, Michigan is falling behind in the clean energy race. 30 other states have already passed measures similar to Proposal 3. States like Iowa, Illinois, Ohio. In Illinois, clean energy is creating jobs while reducing electricity costs for consumers. Proposal 3 will create 94,000 jobs that can't be outsourced. Things are turning around in Michigan. We can't afford to fall behind again. Vote yes on Proposal 3. Rick, fair or foul? Uh, the Truth Squad gave that one a foul, and the reason was uh, ha had to do with the 94,000 uh, jobs claim. It was it, it's kind of a tricky thing. Uh, that that number was based on a study that Michigan State University did on the impact of this proposal. What the study actually said was that it would um, it would result in 94,000 job years which is one job that lasts for a year. Now, most people say, yeah, that's 94,000 jobs. Technically, that's not really true, and it doesn't necessarily translate into 94,000 jobs. Might be 1,000 jobs that last in 94 years. Well, in a strange way, yeah, that could, that's one way of looking at it. Lester. Uh, I just want to make a point that that actually was by Michigan Energy, Michigan Jobs, not uh, the clean, affordable, renewable energy folks. I'm uh, sorry. I read the wrong <coughs> thing. I yeah, should be whipped. <laughs> so, pardon me. He's absolutely right. The CARE group is actually the uh, utility groups and some of the, uh, the union members who unload the coal cars at some of these coal plants. But anyway, uh, on this one, uh, uh, we, uh, we also, we work, uh, I'm, not part of, I'm not one of the truth squatters like this guy is, uh, but we work with the truth squad to, uh, to relay what they found. And uh, we got a lot of grief from uh, my environmental friends for criticizing that 94,000 uh, jobs figure, uh, and, and I got to tell you, 12 years covering the environment, covering every issue that they loved, 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 and I point out one fallacy in one of their ads, and I got crucified for it. So, uh, you know, the truth is the truth, and uh, these guys are trying to find it, we're trying to find it, and uh, sometimes you don't like what you hear, uh, but uh, it, it's it's still the truth. You can't do anything about it. Briefly, where's that ninety-four thousand number comes come from? How does that derive? It, well, it's actually gross jobs created uh, and not net jobs because we kind of lose some jobs because, uh, uh, like I said, guys unloading coal cars are going to lose their jobs. So they're talking about gross jobs uh, uh, added, not net jobs added. And the figure comes, as Rick said, from an MSU study. Uh, and it's these 94,000 job years uh, 
the way you put it was interesting, one job, 94,000 years. The way uh, John Bebo put it was uh, Governor Granholm uh, served two terms, eight years in office, uh, but that was eight job years. So you can see it sounds like a great figure, but it might be 15,000 jobs. It might be 5,000 jobs. We, we don't know, and that's gross jobs, not net increase. Rick, anything to add to that? No, I think he uh, he summed it up uh, pretty nicely. All I know is that in dog years, I'm already dead. <laughs> right, now, the, now the next one, the next one is by Clean, Affordable, Renewable Energy, which is the anti-proposal three, uh, folks. In a few short weeks, you'll be asked to vote on an energy mandate that would be locked into our state constitution, and because it would be locked into the state constitution in a way that cannot be changed quickly or easily. This energy mandate would affect your own family's utility bills and taxes for years to come. So it's important to know the facts. Michigan would be forced to generate 25% of its electricity from renewable energy by the year 2025, even though it's expensive and less reliable because the wind often doesn't blow and the sun doesn't always shine. In fact, this experiment would have an estimated price tag of $12 billion. It works out to thousands of dollars in higher electric bills for Michigan families and small businesses. You have a right to know the facts. Go to careformich.com. Find out more. Get the facts. It's that important. Okay, Lester. Uh, well, uh, I think I'm going to let Rick address some of the specifics, but I want, to, I want to make one point about this and all of the proposals. Uh, one of the concerns about having so many ballot proposals is that uh, many of the voters, not you guys, but many of the voters are going to be completely reliant on uh, these ads. Uh, we're basically bypassing the legislature, uh, regardless of what you think of the makeup of the legislature right now, we're bypassing the legislative process to, uh, to do some of these things. Now, some of these proposals might belong in the Constitution. Others, uh, you have to wonder, wow, do we want to put something so specific into a framework that's supposed to be simple, clear, and a guiding principle for the state, much like the U.S. Constitution. Uh, we could add five new amendments. Uh, I think somebody estimated that that might increase uh, the Constitution's length by 20% or more. So you have to wonder, wow, this is, this is really easy to do. All you have to have is a 50% vote of the people and a really good ad campaign. Uh, so there's a big question about whether this is – maybe we ought to make it harder to amend the, the, the Michigan Constitution. I'm not advocating one way or the other. I'm just saying it's a debate that I think the people ought to have. Mr. Hag you address the, Mr. Uh, Hagelin, yeah. address the specifics of this ad. The Truth Squad gave this one a technical foul, if I recall correctly, which meant that uh, some of the statements in there were uh, misleading and uh, – or needed uh, – a little more explanation. And I think uh, the, the thing that we uh, were questioning, you, you saw the statement, for instance, that this would cost $12 million, billion. or billion, excuse me. Uh, pretty soon it's real money. Um, um, the, and you'll, you may have noticed that it cited a newspaper article as the source of that. The $12 billion actually is an estimate from Consumers Energy, uh, which is one of the main funders of, uh, of this ad. Uh, the utilities, uh, Consumers Energy and uh, DTE Energy, uh, through, the, through September, which is the latest reporting period, have each given 2.9 billion, or 2.9 million, excuse me, million um, to, uh, to this campaign. They're financing all but about $100,000 of it. Um, so there was a question about this $12 billion. Uh, it actually came from consumers. Um, I, I don't know if it was this ad or a similar ad to this one. Also cited a study that was done by public sector consultants out of Lansing uh, as saying that the cost would be $10 billion. Well, it turns out that... Um, First of all, this campaign hired public sector consultants to do that study. Uh, the second thing about it, as I looked through the study, I couldn't find the $10 billion figure. 
12. In it, or <laughs> 10, well, 10, 10, 10, 10 in this one. 10. Oh, that's 10. 10 for this one. I couldn't find that figure, uh, and it turns out it's in a footnote, and the footnote refers to a Michigan State University study that says that it's $10 billion, but the Michigan State University study didn't, didn't characterize it as a cost. It characterized it as the amount of investment that would be needed to meet the $25 million. So the companies that are building the windmills and the solar panels and that, that sort of thing. Um, the public sector consultant study concluded that they, they couldn't figure out how much this was going to cost because there were too many unknowns about the price of energy. So, um, By the way, there's a, bankru <laughs> there's a bankrupt bi-weekly newspaper in Southgate that they quote to, in, in there as a, a source. Uh, but let me ask a quick question. When I read that, uh, that amendment, it says that the cost passed on to people can exceed more than 1% per year, and if they find this impossible to do, they can extend the deadline. Is that not so? That's, that's a good point, and that's correct. Um, the issue there becomes you have to set uh, what a, the, the base cost, and then the, the cost can't rise above 1%. So the issue becomes what's what's the base the initial base cost, um, and that, that that that's the problem. And who would uh, determine there. that? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, probably, I'm guessing the PSC, PSC the public yeah. sector, or the public sector, public the service. public service commission, another PSC. Uh, I, I I think that's probably their response. So it's fair to say lots of unanswered questions. That's correct. Okay. Now moving on to. Uh, uh, one of Michigan's most distinguished citizens, Maddie Maroon, and the uh, the, the bridge, uh, the proposal to require a statewide vote on any new international crossing bridge, tunnel, raft. Uh, this is a commercial by by the group in favor of this amendment called The People Should Decide. Here's why Michigan voters are voting yes on Proposal 6. There's no such thing as a free bridge. It may end up being free during their term of office, but eventually we the people are going to end up paying big for it. Quit being so arrogant with our money. That's our money that the politicians are spending. There's a huge Michigan debt clock that's ticking and getting bigger all the time. We can't go out and start building bridges. Our grandkids are going to have to pay that debt off. I'm voting yes. I'm voting yes. The people should decide. All right, Mr. Haglund. Oh, these ads give me a headache. I've reviewed so many of these, and uh, uh, we we have assessed, uh, I think, a flagrant foul to every ad uh, that this organization, that the people should decide, has has put out. Um, you know, they they just flat out um, do not you know, lie. And they not only did they everybody uh, needs an editor. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Well, not only that, but their their claim that this bridge is somehow going to cost Michigan money really says that they think the governor of the state of Michigan is lying and that everybody who's a party to the agreement that says that Canada will pay for the bridge is lying. I have uh, spent quite a bit of time with the ambassador of bridge spokesperson, Mickey Blashfield, and, and asked him to show me point by point uh, how he backs up the statements that he makes and then the backs up the statements with the ads. Uh, and i got to tell you, even fully understanding where they're coming from, these ads are blatant distortions. Um, they're uh, hoping that people won't bother to uh, really read what's going on here. I don't think there's a single newspaper or media outlet in the state that's made any commentary about this that hasn't pointed this out. Uh, but the guy has spent, we know, $10 million in TV ads across the state. Uh, back of the napkin estimate by uh, myself, uh, I suspect by November he will have spent $15 million in TV ads to try to persuade people uh, that what he's saying is true. And when you look at the ad, these are people like us. I mean, you know, you know, your neighbor looks like these uh, these folks, and uh, and they're absolutely convinced that our grandkids are going to pay when Canada is not only paying for the bridge, but it's paying for the connections that we have to build to get to the bridge. So they're paying Michigan's share, 
And the U.S. Department of Transportation has said, okay, that money that Canada gave you, $550 million that they've put up front that will be recovered in tolls, we're going to let you use that as matching money for federal funds so you can get another $2 billion that you can spend on transportation issues anywhere else in the state in a state that really is starting to see some infrastructure problems with bridges and roads across the state. So uh, this is a uh, – I'm going to fall, I'm going to fall short of, of saying – that this is a good deal because it's not my place to say it's a good deal. Um, but you would agree that we get a free bridge and $2.1 billion. Yes. So, it's a better the, day than I ever had at Bob Lowe. The, the, <laughs> the, the, caveat, the caveat being that we will, uh, as, as the Ambassador Bridge folks, will, we will forego some of the taxes from the Ambassador Bridge because they will have fewer people crossing their bridge. We'll lose money that way, and we might lose a little money on the tolls on the Blue Water Bridge at uh, Port Huron. But... Other than that, Rick, want to add anything? Well, I, you know, I, like Lester said, I, I, the one thing I will credit them for is that they've got very well done persuasive ads. If you, if you, uh, if you don't know the facts, um, these, these ads will, will, will draw you in. Can we expect anybody coming up with ads in favor of... We're about to see I'm one. glad you asked that, <coughs> Irving. All right, the next one... We're, we're going to see one right now by the Pro Bridge folks. When people ask where the new Detroit to Windsor Bridge is headed, tell them forward. More than just concrete and steel, this bridge is girded with hope and prosperity and thousands of new jobs. It's grounded in stronger national security and spans to a future fueled by the promise of international growth. It's a connection built on trust and progress to take us to a brighter future without costing Michigan taxpayers a dime. Say yes to Michigan's bridge. Okay. Lester? Uh, I would talk to uh, – well, it's, it's pretty fair. The tens of thousands of jobs are temporary jobs mostly for uh, – but it could cause uh, a spur in the economy that could – uh, cause real job growth in Michigan. So, the, But the 10,000 jobs they're talking about are mostly construction jobs, uh, U.S. construction jobs, I should say, because the Canadians and the U.S. Uh, workers will be building that bridge if it's built. Uh, that, uh, according to Rich Robinson at the Michigan Campaign Finance Network, uh, $270,000 was spent airing that ad this summer. If you recall, I said $10 million by the Maroon family. This aired on Madison Heights Cable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 270000 so far. Uh, I've asked the Detroit Regional Chamber of Commerce why they aren't putting money up to uh, run ads similar to this. I've asked uh, uh, a lot of different folks, including Ford Motor Company, why aren't you running ads like this? And everybody said, well, well w we'd probably donate a little if somebody would ask. Well, if the Detroit Regional Chamber isn't running this, uh, it's going to do them the most good. Why the heck would anybody uh, do it if they're not going to do it? So I don't understand why they can't uh, get a coalition together to gel to actually put a campaign on. In the meantime, the governor and the lieutenant governor are doing homemade videos and uh, trying to uh, put them on YouTube. Okay. Rick? The Truth Squad reviewed this ad last summer. I think that was the only time it ran, and uh, I believe we, we said that there wasn't anything um, untruthful about this ad, that it was, that it was okay. Um, the, um, the, the issue, maybe we can talk a little bit about this. I don't know if now is the, the right time, but the issue of why aren't there more ads out there to counter Matty Maroon's anti-bridge ads, um, one of the explanations I've heard, and Lester can correct me if I'm wrong because he's looked into this much more deeply uh, than I have, is that um, there is a thought that uh, the, I think the governor maintains that this ballot proposal uh, doesn't mean anything because um, the agreement to build the bridge is already in place. So even if this ballot it proposal passes, it, it's, it won't take effect. Obviously, there's going to be a big dispute about that. It's going to end up in court. But I think that may be one reason. But it would affect any future no bridge, right? If you want to build another bridge in Port Huron someday, it would apparently affect that. Yeah, yes, and there's also uh, some interpretation that it, this may apply to even um, domestic bridges uh, in right. the state, the way that it's written. So I yeah. want to ask the audience something, and I want you, regardless of how you feel about the bridge, first of all, I want to know which ad is more effective. So first of all, how many of you thought the Maddie Maroon ad 
the first ad was more effective. How many of you thought the governor's ad was, or the, the other, ad, the Pearl Bridge ad was more effective? I agree with you. I'm sorry, did, did you, either of you want to say anything more about this? Before? Uh, well, uh, to that point, I think they spent $15 to produce the uh, Pearl Bridge ad. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now we've got one by people who don't like anything very much, a group called Hands Off Our Constitution. Here they come again. Special interest groups want to rewrite Michigan's constitution, your constitution. They'll spend tens of millions to get you to say yes to their hidden agendas. Their proposals are loaded with loopholes and special interest power grabs so they can cash in on our constitution. Make no mistake, their plans will cost you a bundle. Say no to the special interests and send them a clear message. Hands off our constitution. Rick, fair or foul? Uh, the Truth Squad gave that one a foul basically because uh, it provided no uh, supporting documentation for any of its claims. Um, and uh, uh, one of the things that we noted, you may have seen as he's rifling through the newspapers, there's, a, um, there's an op-ed piece in there by Frank Kelly uh, who's saying that um, these, uh, the, these ballot proposals are a bad idea. Uh, Frank Kelly, who was the former Attorney General of the State of Michigan and is now a lobbyist, is also a lobbyist for DTE. He's, he's, a, he's uh, on the, the lobbying payroll of DTE Energy. So um, there was a, obviously a, a, a bit of a conflict there. But the basic problem we had for this it was it made lots of claims and it didn't provide any, uh, any uh, supporting evidence. Lester? Uh, now, you all heard me say I'm not sure whether we should muddy up the Constitution. At the same time, I'm going to, sound some, I'm going to say something that seems a little contradictory. This ad uh, actually is paid for, the bulk of it is paid for by the Chamber of Commerce, the Michigan Chamber of Commerce, and, it, and they decided rather than try to do a five-prong ad campaign to fight these five different ballot proposals or three that we don't like or four that we don't like, they just said, let's just say the heck with all of them. And we'll run at one ad. We'll save a lot of money that way, and uh, and so that's the result you see. I think that uh, I think that Michigan voters should take a look at each proposal carefully, decide for themselves whether this is something that they think is important to the state, and then make their decision uh, whether it uh, whether we should be putting it in the Constitution. A completely different question. We're there, so now you got to make a decision: which ones work for you, and which ones don't. So uh, saying they all don't work. Uh, just because it's a cheaper ad campaign seems to be <laughs> problematic. Well, you know, there is, has been some research, however, that has shown that when you get more than about three proposals on the ballot, there's a natural tendency of people to vote no because they, they you know, they, they don't understand them. Uh, I just want to say a couple of things. Technically, Frank Kelly sold that firm, and but, but uh, he, I think he's still, because I talked to him about that very issue, but he, he claims that he sold it and he doesn't make any more or less money, but he's absolutely right. The firm he founded represents... Uh, DTE. Um, one little interesting factoid. Since 1791, the U.S. Constitution has been amended 18 times. Since 1963, the Michigan Constitution has already been amended 31 times. So, okay, moving from sublime to the ridiculous, or at least from the ballot proposals to uh, um, candidates, we're going to look at a couple of candidates from the Senate, uh, commercials from candidates running for the U.S. Senate. Some of you may remember there's a U.S. Senate race. The first one is, uh, is for, by the Stabenow folks. At American Expedition Vehicles, we have over 500 employees, and their jobs are in jeopardy due to counterfeit parts coming out of China. That's why Debbie Stabenow wrote the bill, cracking down on unfair Chinese trade violations and currency manipulation that hurt American businesses. Senator Stabenow understands the threat of counterfeit products coming out of China, and she's working with companies like mine all over Michigan, saving manufacturing jobs. I'm Debbie Stabenow, and I approve this message. Well, Rick Haglin, do you approve this ad? Uh, we did. Uh, the Truth Squad found that there was, uh, there was nothing wrong with this ad. Uh, uh, Debbie Stabenow sponsored the legislation that the ad says that she did, and uh, th there was nothing, uh, n nothing defined uh, as a misstatement. Mr. Graham? Uh, I have not studied the Stabenow or the Hookstra ads, so I am going to say, I don't know. 
but I will say on a lot of these, in general, a lot of these candidate campaign ads, um, you'll, see, you'll hear a lot of claims about they voted against something, and uh, the fact is it might have been part of a package that was offensive to, you know, all of the, the U.S. or, or all of uh, Michigan. Uh, there's a lot of gotcha stuff that goes on in these candidate ads. I hate them. Because unless you go back through 12 years' worth of voting records to find out whether that was a real vote against something or just happened to be part of a real foul package, you never know. So I highly recommend that you completely ignore candidate ads and go look for yourself about what their policies are. What a heretical statement. Uh, <laughs> all right, now there's one called Meet the Parents, which I thought was a movie, but it's actually from the Hoekstra people. <laughs> Ryan's a political science major, Daddy. Oh, poli sci, huh? Well, how about that, uh, Debbie Stabenow? Never met a tax increase she didn't like. Worst senator Michigan's ever had. I can't really say I agree with you, Mr. C. I think what makes Stabenow the worst senator we've ever had is all her wasteful spending. Huh. And that's something our generation is going to have to pay for. All over Michigan, the great debate is raging. What makes Debbie Stabenow the worst senator ever? Well, I got one word for you, Ryan. Obamacare, one of the biggest tax increases in history. And Stabenow was the key vote. Well, I have one word for you, sir. Stimulus. She voted to spend $800 billion, and it didn't really stimulate anything. More potatoes? Stabenow got an F from the National Taxpayers Union, but I'm sure you've seen a few Fs yourself, haven't you, Ryan? <laughs> she also got one of the lowest ratings by Citizens Against Government Waste. Ryan, oh, what is your minor? You can join the debate by visiting WorstSenator.com and vote why you think Debbie Stabenow is the worst Michigan senator ever. She voted against a middle-class tax cut, which directly impacts my take-home pay. Over 70,000 earmarks. Death tax. She voted to raise the debt limit over and over and Brian, over. Ryan, Daddy, that's enough. <sighs> it's Stabenow's failure on jobs that makes her the worst senator. Oh, oh please, that's, that's not even... And the great debate goes on. Well, as I was once told on a first debate, uh, on a first date, that was different. Um, Lester, <laughs> Lester, what do you think? I think it's a great sitcom. <laughs> you can watch much TV, Lester, do you? <laughs> Rick? Uh, we found uh, quite a few things wrong with this ad. Uh, <laughs> In, in terms of some of the, uh, the claims it made, uh, one of the things about the Truth Squad um, is that we, we, don't, we don't give it a foul or a technical foul or some of the other terms of the, that we use because we don't like the ad or don't like the message. We look at actual statements of fact and whether they're true or not and whether the claims that they're making are backed up. Um, uh, Hookstra has decided to, to lay this label of uh, worst senator ever on uh, Debbie Stabenow. Well, how do you evaluate that? You know, I mean, it, they're, they're saying she's the worst senator in Michigan's history. Well, there was I, one who was indicted, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Truman Newberry, yeah. and yeah. yeah. Uh, interesting, just as, as, as kind of an aside, as we were working on that, we ran across a, a similar ad that was done in the Wisconsin. Um, gubernatorial race a couple of years ago where um, the uh, Scott Walker the, the governor was calling his opponent who had been the mayor who was the mayor of Milwaukee the worst mayor in Milwaukee's history so so these are kind of the same consulting groups that are doing these uh, these ads in different states um, some of the there were a number of, of different uh, factual claims made in there um, the $800 million or uh, $800 billion stimulus package didn't do anything. Well, it actually did, whether it was totally effective or not but was, is another question. But um, the, uh, I think it was the GAO that was charged with, with monitoring this did come out and say, yes, it, it created you know, X number of jobs. 
uh, over a certain period of time. It, it did have some some impact. Um, so anyway, we 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 gave it a we gave it a, a foul for various uh, misstatements. Lester, was she the key vote on passing uh, the president's health care bill? Uh, you know, I've been watching the Lansing State House more than I've been watching the Capitol. Uh, but I don't think Washington, it was a one vote thing. No, it was it was she was a a voter right. in, in the Senate. There were a hundred of them. Uh, you know, I guess they all have a vote. I don't think she's passing anything on her own. Uh, we've seen a lot of ads like that. Uh, uh, in fact, it works the other way too. Um, Speaker of the House uh, of Michigan, uh, Jace Bolger, talks about the things that he passed this year and. He still only got one vote in, uh, 100, among 110 in the uh, Michigan House, so it works both ways. You can blame one politician for something uh, passing, or you can take credit for all of it uh, because you happen to vote in that Do one Do either of you passed. find it curious that the name Hookster was never mentioned? That, that's pretty common these days. I mean, you saw at the end that he paid – his can candidate committee paid for the ad, which – you know, these days, just the fact that there's a candidate campaign paying for the ad and it's not some masqueraded group paid for by 501c4 is, is pretty amazing right there. And, and usually, especially if it's a 30-second ad, if it's an attack ad, the, uh, the candidate that's doing the attack ad, uh, doing the attacking, doesn't mention himself uh, in the ad. It's always it's, it's keyed to the opponent. Well, now we're, gonna, we're about to move on to the interesting part, which is where we talk to you. Um, I want to mention one thing. I'm, I've been uh, derelict maybe in not mentioning this, but and maybe all of you know this, but there are actually six proposals on the ballot. The first one, the emergency manager law, which we didn't talk about tonight, is not a constitutional amendment. It is a, a revision in a law, which, which is different, but that's on the ballot as, as well. Tonight I think we're primarily concerned with the constitutional Amendments, proposed amendments, but we can certainly answer questions about that too. So there's a handheld mic here somewhere. And hey, Jack. Oh, I'm sorry. Jack, can I interrupt yes, this for I'm a sorry. second? I, I just, how many of you thought that that uh, worst senator ever uh, ad was an effective ad? <laughs> it was funny, right? I mean, for somebody who's not informed about the issues, that would probably catch your attention. One of the things uh, we studied was that. Um, uh, recently was that negative ads really work. We hate them, but uh, there's been enough political science and uh, sociology and psychological studies to find out negative ads really work. But they work, don't they, they work, don't, don't they, to, def to keep the supporters of the attack person from voting rather than changing minds? Not always. Uh, in fact, what happens is they pay attention. In fact, one of the analysts said that there's actually usually more policy information in a negative ad than in a positive ad. Uh, we don't pay attention to uh, positive ads because they're not going to harm us. But we hear something that in a negative ad that th we think might alarm us, might be a problem for us, we're going to pay attention then. So it's, it's, an, interesting, uh, it's an interesting trick that uh, the sociologists have already figured out and the campaign uh, coordinators are really starting to pay attention to now. Rick, anything to add to that? Um, no. <laughs> I thought he was going to say, Debbie Stedman, I'll kill my puppy. <laughs> okay, well, I, I, I'm glad Lester asked that. Okay, who is the, who is the microphone? Okay, Carol, Carol, there's a hand up over there. We're going to get Carol at uh, her workout tonight. Uh, if you could say who you are and tell us who you're addressing your question to. Uh, okay, my name is Laura Boos, and I have one comment and then one question. The comment is on that hookster ad. I also found it very sexist. You got the little girl and the mother, and it's just the men who are debating this. So I found it very, that's Good why point. I did not think it was at all effective. And that's just a comment. Now the question I have, uh, whoever can answer it, assume I'm addressing it, what is involved in repealing an amendment to the Michigan State Constitution? An amendment to the state constitution. You have to have another amendment. It, it takes an amendment uh, to the state constitution to reveal uh, to repeal any part or whole of a, another amendment. And the amendments are just done by the po amendments are made by the popular vote. They the can legislature be, can yeah, they can be done through the legislature. You probably know the process better than I. Uh, I I don't really. Uh, I, th I, I don't think it's a supermajority vote of the legislature to. Okay. Yeah. But the general the general in, in general you would put them on the ballot. The legislature would vote or there'd be a referendum. The legislature can vote to put them on the ballot too, which. 
Right, the, instead of the petition right. uh, path. Um, my name is Kathleen Maisner. I'm from Waterford. And um, to Mr. Graham, I think you said earlier that public um, sector unions don't pay. Uh, people who don't want to be part of the union don't pay. Depends on, it depends on uh, whether it's state or whether it's uh, um, like a, district, a school district or something mm -hmm. like that. It varies from, from place to place, but it's not yeah. absolutely mandated, oh, okay. as I understand it. Okay. Cause if you're a union member. Uh, I am. Uh, and, and, and you know better than correct. I am, that's and I they do. <laughs> uh, teachers do. I, I, don't, I can't speak for police or firefighters. But, um, but my question is, I'm wondering why you didn't talk about three and five. Yeah, we did talk about three. That's you the, mean uh, four, four and five. I mean four and five. I'm sorry, four and five, yeah. Well, I think we don't – I don't believe we have any ads for those groups, at least. Yeah, not. Four, four has had some mailers. Uh, five, I don't believe, has had any TV ads, but they've had some radio ads. The recap, for those of you who may not remember, Proposal 4 is the Home Health Care Act, which would set up a registry of home health care workers and uh, um, re require, the, require the state – through no visible funding mechanism to reimburse people for the cost of hiring these folks. Proposal 5 is kill everybody. It, it, uh, it, proposal 5 is the proposal that's, that says that in order to raise any tax ever under any circumstances, you would either have to have a two-thirds vote of the legislature or a vote of the people that would have to be held in November, no other time. Jack, who's paying for that? Well, I, who's paying for what? The, the petition the, drive to get that on the ballot? Um, one, uh, Manuel J. Maroon, who, uh, <laughs> it, uh, you know, it, who it, it's sort of Maddie's revenge. And, and it's not quite clear, except that he's in alliance with some anti-tax groups that have helped him on the bridge proposal, or some people, Rich Robinson, who we mentioned from the nonpartisan Michigan Campaign Finance Network, speculated that he's doing this either to punish the state for trying to limit his bridge or to make it doubly sure that no new bridge can ever be built. Yeah, the, the speculation is, and it's complete speculation, right. uh, when they went out to get the petitions, they needed uh, people to do it. The Tea Party in the state had the people. Uh, Maddie Maroon had the money. The Tea Party wanted this two-thirds vote, uh, so the two petitions were circulated together for uh, you know, a vote on the bridge, and two-thirds majority, so we think it's a, we think speculative that it was a quid pro quo. The Tea Party and Matty Maroon teamed up together and said, well, we want this, you want that, you've got money, we've got people, let's go do this. Uh, Eddie, does that answer your question, more or less? I, I would just say that um, there have been some proposal for ads. Uh, a couple of them are reviewed on the Truth Squad website, which is michigantruthsquad.com. And, and you all should know about the, that website. I think one of the best developments, one of the most encouraging things in my declining years in the state has been the, the establishment of the Michigan Truth Squad. It's the first time in history when anyone has attempted in a dispassionate way to rate these ads. And, poli you know, politics today is all about television advertising, <coughs> and this is a very important service. Yeah, between the Truth Squad and between Rich Robinson's Michigan Campaign Finance Network, uh, which keeps track of who's spending money and where, uh, whether it's reported publicly or whether he goes from TV station to TV station and looks at the numbers, he keeps an eye, eye on uh, who's spending what. Uh, between those two, you can get a pretty good picture of what's going on in the state and who's buying what. It's mcfn.org if anyone wants right. to look up your own individual race. Next question. Hi, uh, my, Mike Kapitansky. I live in Livonia. Uh, I just wanted to add a quick comment to what Lester was just saying. I, I actually have a friend who, <coughs> excuse me, is uh, kind of one of the higher ups in the local Tea Party people, and he pretty much told me as much that uh, his group and, and his followers in the Tea Party pretty much killed the first bill by calling all their senators repeatedly over and over and over and making it sound as if there was this upswelling from the people who didn't want the bridge and uh, and. He didn't say, you know, we're in cahoots with Manny Maroon, but he made it clear to me that they're on the same page on a lot of issues and that that was something that they all had common interests in. So 
if to I what you were speculating, it, uh, it doesn't surprise me. I think that you're absolutely right about the Tea Party, but uh, it's also true that uh, Maddie Maroon contributed heavily to the campaigns uh, and other allied causes of a lot of the legislators who killed the bridge. It's also worth noting that in Indiana and Ohio, states that also have Republican majorities in the legislature, their legislatures voted unanimously to support a new bridge, but they weren't getting any contributions from Mr. Maroon. Thank you. My name is Jane, and I live in Canton, and I'd like to have you make a little bit more commentary on one, even though it isn't... Uh, you mean uh, the emergency manager law? Yes, because uh, that, uh, law. that's very confusing because of what's been going on. Rick, you've been following this. Park. Do you want to... Well, the, uh, that, was, that got on the ballot due to the efforts uh, primarily of the unions that... Um, do not like um, the the emergency manager law, particularly the provision that allows emergency financial managers to uh, tear up union contracts. Uh, Michigan has had an emergency financial manager law for some time, but it got toughened uh, in the last year um, under new legislation. So um, basically, it's it's the unions that are trying to to undo that that uh, that new power of the the financial managers. Ben, the court has ruled against that, so I don't really know where we stand, and I think that a lot of people don't either. The court has ruled against what? The um, I guess oh. the changes that that were. Yes, the the court um, the the court has kind of held the new law in abeyance until the outcome of the election is known. So right now we're operating under the terms of the old emergency financial manager law until we find out what happens in the election. Um, this is actually just a provision of how it always works when you put a law on the ballot, is it not? That once you once you have a law where you have something challenging and putting on the ballot, the law, is, as I understand it, automatically suspended until the vote. That, that's right. That's right. If if the if the if the uh, issue fails, and which would put the new law back into effect, then that lawsuit I think will pick up again, and they'll they'll hear arguments. A actually, that. I think. Instead of me getting it wrong this time, I think you may have gotten it back. It is very confusing. As I understand it, if you vote yes, you're voting to reinstate the emergency manager law. If you vote no, because what they've done is they've just stuck the law on the ballot. And I think a lot of people are confused okay. by this. I was at first, too. Mm -hmm. If you vote yes, it means that you want the governor's emergency manager law. If you vote no, it means not. And another problem, um, uh, Lester probably has things to add that I don't, but it is not at all clear now legally. The governor's position is that we revert to the 1986 old emergency financial manager law, but people are filing suit now to say, no, you don't automatically reinstate it. There is no emergency manager law. Yeah. So that's Cl sort of the claim is The claim is that PA4, which is the, the uh, emergency financial manager law that was, uh, um, that was passed by the Snyder administration, PA4 has been dismissed. That doesn't mean that, and it, when it was passed, it displaced the old emergency financial manager law. Now they're saying, okay, well, PA4 is suspended. We go back to the old emergency manager law. No, it's gone. It was displaced by PA4, but uh, the attorney general has ruled, nah, we're going to keep that in place. Uh, we're going to act uh, as if that's the law. Um, Nobody repealed it. They just replaced right, it. Yeah. Right. Uh, so... We're in limbo right now, and when the top uh, law officer of the state, the attorney general, says this is the way it's going to be, unless you want to take that, the courts, nobody wants to do that because we're so close to the election. I mean, we're, you know, we're going to see what happens November 6th, and that's going to decide the matter. This is a full employment act for lawyers. <laughs> We've got a question over here. 
first of all, despite what the radio led me to believe, you're all much more handsome in person. But There's an excellent optometrist on Main Street. <laughs> I told you, Jack, you look great. So, I, I first came into contact with Maddie Maroon when he was pushing around Rashida Tlaib a few years ago. My question is, are there any long-lasting effects of one person buying the legislature and pushing these through to, assuming they're successful, these two proposals th through, I mean, is it, does it have a precedent? And is there, do you think the game will change in Michigan for millionaires or billionaires with a pile of cash and something they need? Lester? Well, uh, first of all, you know, Maddie Maroon didn't give uh, any more to the state legislators than he legally can, which I think is like $500 for a state representative. $5,000. Uh, $500 for a state representative oh, yeah. and $1,000 for a state senator for any given election uh, cycle. Uh, so he hasn't done anything illegal. Uh, there have been other people, DeVos, who have given a lot more uh, than Maddie Maroon ever thought about it. In fact, as Rich Robinson put it, uh, Maddie Maroon looks like a piker compared to uh, uh, the DeVos family and, and others uh, when it comes to giving money to the, the legislature. But, you know, we've got rules. It's transparent. The one thing that happened in this case that was really bothersome to me is that Maddie Maroon gave a big chunk of money to a public action committee, a, a, a PAC. And then that PAC turned around and spent a bunch of money on a state legislator uh, for a big, big Mackinac Island blowout. And that happened right before this guy blocked a vote on the bridge in the legislature. You know, when you watch money being filtered through through a PAC, and it wasn't a huge amount as these things go, it was $10,000, it still makes you go, oh, wow, that's how we do politics today. We don't give to the candidate in a transparent way. We filter it through a PAC or a super PAC or some other way, and that's how influence is peddled these days. So I'm not worried about Maddie Maroon giving to every state rep and every state senator. As long as it's all seen, it's not all seen. And he gave a lot of money to the Senate Republican Caucus to have some right. kind of event. That's exactly. Right. Um, I think also your question kind of gets to the implications of one person essentially buying two ballot, uh, two constitutional amendments on the ballot, uh, which he is trying to do. I don't know that we've ever seen that before, uh, where you had one person essentially financing uh, two two constitutional amendments. And I, th you know, I think the the outcome of that is 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 uh, fairly distressing. Um, this also kind of gets to the whole issue of of uh, ballot proposals, and, and there there have been some some uh, thought that maybe Michigan should change its law to make it harder to get things on the ballot, or or eliminate that 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 whole ballot proposal uh, uh, step entirely. Um, you know, there's there's two sides to that coin. One is that uh, you know ballot putting things on the ballot. Um, is, is, is really kind of part of the democracy. It gives people an opportunity to, uh, to have a vote on something. If, if for instance, you think that, that the legislature isn't responding to uh, issues that, that, that need to be addressed, uh, you have the right to go and put something on the ballot. The other side to it is that th these, are being, these ballot proposals are increasingly being uh, driven by people that have a lot of money and they can they can uh, hire people to go out and collect ballot signatures, and it's and if you've got enough money, it's pretty easy to get stuff on the ballot. If if, if you got enough money to pay for the signatures and you and you word the the question properly, uh, you, it's pretty easy to get on the ballot. And I, and I think there's some questions, um, you know, some some things to think about there. Now I know you've got. Uh, uh ballot gathering story because I've, I've right. heard it and I'd love to hear it again. I'm sure these folks, but I was in uh, your neighboring town here, Ferndale, uh, one day uh, earlier this year and there was a petition gatherer there and uh, of course I, I don't sign petitions, I'm a journalist, but the person I was with um, was curious and so I was eavesdropping listening to what the petition gatherer was saying. Now nobody forced the more than 600,000 people, and they only needed something like 300,000 signatures, 600,000 people in this state signed a petition saying, yeah, we ought to have a vote on whether we have international crossings. Every time. 
Nobody forced them to do that, but I listened to the petition gatherer and what he told my friend, and it was not exactly even close to the truth. It sounded like she was signing something far, far different than uh, what was being uh, proposed uh, by this ballot proposal. So I don't know how you stop that. Uh, and it's I think you've done the same right. thing. Yeah, in fact, my, my significant other and I, we, we, I have a shack in Charlevoix, so we go up there whenever we can. And since I drink gallons of coffee, we stop at every rest area. And they had all these people. <laughs> and because my voice, you know, is somewhat known, I wouldn't talk to them, but she would talk to them. And they, li they just blatantly lied. They said, well, this is supporting the governor's bridge, and the governor wants this. And uh, um, on the tax limitation one, she said, what if there's an emergency? They said, well, it doesn't take effect in case of an emergency. Which is, but to answer your basic question, um, if these two things pass, whether you're for them or against them, they will dramatically impact life in this state. First of all, you'll never be able to build any bridge without a, a vote of the people, any international bridge. And the Ambassador Bridge was built in 1929 with the maximum lifespan of 100 years. And also, if this legislature is unable to raise taxes, it, what this will mean is 13 people in the Senate can kill any tax ever, no matter what, national emergency, nuclear meltdown, they, you can't get a tax increase. So that's going to be a little bit daunting, and that will affect life in the state. Incidentally, there are very few people left who wrote this Constitution 50 years ago. And I've talked to a couple of them, and they both said one was a Republican, one was a liberal Democrat. They both said this is something they never foresaw, the idea that corporations or special interests would come in, spend a bunch of money. You need you, The actual figure you need is 10 percent of the vote cast for governor at the last election, since some signatures are always invalid. You need about 400,000. You've got to submit about 400,000 realistically. And they just thought in rare cases people would get, you know, their friends and they'd all get signatures. They never saw that somebody would come in and buy them. But that's the way it's turned out. Hi, my name is Julie. I'm from Tecumseh. I have uh, that's, my, that's my town. <laughs> He'll give you a ride home. <laughs> it's a long drive. <laughs> I have less of a question and more of a, a, a reassurance that I'm looking for. Part of my frustration, I'm a new Michigan resident and, and really paying attention this time, part of my frustration is some of these issues I really agree with, but I don't agree that they're constitutional amendments. Do you have any reassurance on that? Is there anything that, that to help me... Yeah, I, I Come to peace with this dilemma. That, that is the system as we've been given it. Uh, and so if you believe uh, that in, in an issue strongly enough uh, and you've thought about the unintended consequences of enshrining it in the Constitution, um, I, I'd say you need to support the things you support and vote against the things you disagree with. That's, that's the system we have right now. Uh, I would agree with that. Um, you know, you you may um, you you may agree with uh, the fact that we need collective bargaining strengthened in the state. You may be uncomfortable about the fact that it's in the Constitution, but I can assure you, the legislature, at least in the next few years, is never going to uh, put that uh, put the collective bargaining proposal into law. So, at the same time. I'm not here to give reassurance. I'm just here to depress people. At the same time, a constitution is supposed to be sort of a framework. It is supposed to be a general document. It's not supposed to be a Christmas tree and hung with things. General, journalists aren't supposed to give their own opinions, but um, I'm a maverick. And I'll say, I think home health care for seniors is a great idea. And every morning when I look in the mirror, I think it's a better idea. It would save, it would save, it would save money. It's, it's cheaper to care for people. But I don't happen to think that belongs in the Constitution. And I also think, and again, some of these proposals, if you read them, that particular proposal includes an unfunded mandate to pay for this without saying where the money is going to come from. So I think the question you raise is very legitimate. And if you want an example of a state where this has really impacted in what most think is a negative way, look at California. California has had sort of petition government run amok, so the legislature is largely um, uh, ineffectual, effectual, and, you know, Michigan could adopt the slogan, Michigan government might be well advised to adopt the slogan, at least we're not California, not yet. 
you know, the one thing, two years ago, we had the opportunity to say, well, let's scrap our Constitution and rewrite a new one, and we, just, we opted not to do that. Uh, Fourteen years from now, we'll be given the same opportunity because in the Constitution, it says every 16 years, the people will decide whether there should be a constitutional convention and decide whether we need to rewrite this thing. So two years ago, we said, eh, it's fine. Now we're going to add 20% to it if we, uh, if we pass all these proposals. So, so just be patient for 14 years, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, <laughs> The people can, oh, by the way, what the people can uh, call for a constitutional convention. All you have to do is gather uh, about uh, 400,000 sure, signatures. Yeah, 400,000 signatures, yeah. I'd like to go back to the bridge thing. If uh, the no bridge uh, amendment passes, what happens if somebody decides to, like, uh, build a ferry or build a ferry or not build it, but run a ferry or something like that, is that also going to be prohibited? Okay. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't necessarily stop the bridge. It just says the people have to vote on any inter international crossing in which taxpayer money is spent. International crossing, right. Right. Uh, now, the fact is there is not a single crossing uh, that – state money won't be spent. For example, I think Cranes has been reporting that there's a $400 million railroad tunnel that wants to be built. It's going to be built by the railroads. But the Department of Transportation in Michigan has to spend some money to change maps and things like that. If you're not spending one penny of tax, uh, if you're spending just one penny of tax dollars, suddenly that men amendment will be. And so a privately paid for tunnel would have to be approved by the voters because we might spend a penny to change the map. Uh, it, it's, it's ridiculous when you take it to the nth degree, mm -hmm. uh, but, but that's, that's, that's one way of interpreting that. But this would not stop the bridge. It would only require a vote of the people, which if you're going to spend another $10, $15 million to convince people that we don't need a bridge is probably going to be a pretty easy thing to do. Well, I understand that it won't stop the bridge. But I'm talking about future international crossings. Any bridge, yeah. That's just, you know, any bridge like or said, tunnel. It would, it would, it would, yeah, or tunnel. The, the train, the train, uh, the ferry, or whatever other ferries, crossing. Ferries you know. are a different story because, oh, wow. uh, but, but um, um, because they're not actually specifically said. It says tunnels, bridges, right. or anything that a vehicle uses. I guess a ferry. Mm -hmm. Right. Is but I, I would think there is a ferry. It's the Detroit Windsor Truck Ferry, which exists to take. Uh, trucks carrying hazardous waste over now they can't legally use the bridge but the owner of that has told me that it really isn't economically feasible to have sort of major crossings by ferry mm -hmm. whether this amendment would apply I'm not sure Rick are you an expert on ferries? I am not oh. yeah I can't uh, and there is a debate that. you know there's a date that's in this amendment yes uh, which is kind of like a post dated check except we're Last January, it, January 1st, 2012. So they're trying to say, they're, they're trying to get around the governor's concern that, hey, the agreement's already been signed with Canada. It's a done deal. Uh, if, you, if this amendment passes, uh, they'll be able to argue, well, no, it's not a done deal. The Constitution says this backdates to January 2012, which predates the agreement with Canada when Canada said, in we'll, general, pay, we'll courts pay for have it. Held, in general, courts have held you can't pass ex post facto laws. But... It's we a constitutional know. amendment, Jack. Well, I mean, can you amend the Constitution retroactively? We'll see. Right, well, that's true. <laughs> yeah. uh, Jacob McGraw, and I'm from uh, Milford, Michigan. Uh, my question had to do with uh, Proposal 3, and I believe the Truth God uh, rated the 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 ad from Michigan Jobs and Energy as a technical foul, uh, technical foul. And I was curious, it seemed to be a little more of a, a foul to me. Um, you said it was because it was misleading or needed explaining. This was the pro uh, 25 by 25 ad? This was a con. The con. And uh, my, my problem with uh, that rating of a technical foul instead of a foul is because the ad specifically said it was more expensive and less reliable, and they claimed the number of $12 billion. And uh, according to DTE's own numbers, their proposed Fermi-3 reactor in Monroe, Michigan, uh, is $15 billion, according to the utility, which is way far and beyond the $12 billion uh, named for in the ad, which seems 
like a foul as opposed to a technical foul. The Any comments? What does the fifteen billion for Fermi refer to? That's how much uh, DTE is claiming that Fermi three would cost to be built, and it's proposed. They're not building it yet, but as a comparison of how expensive the alternatives to renewables are, uh, fifteen billion seems well above. That doesn't even include. Uh, the cost of nuclear waste, which we haven't even figured out how to deal with the waste of the But the wind the doesn't always reactor. blow and the sun doesn't always shine, but nuclear fission is forever. And well, a actually, I would say if you've been following the, uh, the, the news, the nuclear reactors haven't been running uh, constantly anyway. Yeah, a, lot of the, it's, yeah. a lot of them have been shut down, and, and Fermi, too, has been shut down numerous times recently. Well, like too. I said, I, I don't, uh, I'm not one of the guys reviewing these ads. Uh, he is, but I will say that, uh, and, and I got quite a few comments from my environmental friends about that specific, yeah. uh, it's a technical foul, it ought to be a foul. You know, these are judgments. Uh, they're hard to, to you know, the, they're qualitative judgments. Um, uh, I don't know if you guys have scales that you follow or, or how you do that, but there's always going to be disagreement about just how foul is foul, I think. Yeah, the, when, and yes, the, that's, that's been an issue uh, at times because uh, they're, you know, they can, there is some, some fine lines there um, that, uh, but, but are fine distinctions between some of those. But um, I think the, um, I mean, I think what we were saying in that ad is that, um, the numbers that were thrown out there weren't necessarily wrong, uh, but they were um, they were um, you know they weren't properly uh, cited in the ad. I mean, if you say the ad says it's going to cost twelve billion dollars, and then they cite a, a newspaper story as the they don't they don't come out and say. This estimate was a, was an estimate from Consumers Energy. It doesn't even say it was a newspaper. It was just in this newspaper. They didn't even say, you know, right. well, we knew it was an ad. Right. That'd be more of a foul than saying it should be a foul, not a technical foul. <laughs> well, this was very useful to me because people have been, listeners have been telling me for a long time that I should put my commentaries where the sun doesn't always shine. <laughs> now I know what was meant by that. In Michigan, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think, I, you know, I, I don't think these guys, uh, and again, I'm, I'm going to play apologist for them because I think they're doing a fine job. I think the Truth Squad's done a really fair job on all of these issues. I don't envy them the job they have to do. There's a lot of research they've got to, because they've got to figure out where the heck did they get that number and, and why That's is, very it, is key. it valid they, or not. I, he, he is so right, and I would I invite you all to go on the Internet and read about these things. You'll learn more than the process. You'll learn a lot more about the issues than we can even give you tonight. So you don't have to agree with them, but I think they'll have a lot of good information and you can make up in your own mind. But that's what it's all about, right? Getting you pointed in the direction so you can decide, well, I don't agree with their findings, but I'm glad I've, they've got all the links to the original document and, the re and how they came to their conclusions. So that's, that's helpful. Um, hi, I'm Rob Duchesne. I live in Royal Oak. Um, my question isn't strictly speaking about a proposal, but it is about the election. Uh, this whole issue of challenging people to prove their citizenship um, has come up, and as I understand, the legislature uh, passed a bill uh, saying that people should affirm their citizenship, and the governor vetoed it. Okay, I thought it was a dead issue, and then it comes up from the grave, and Ruth Johnson, uh, Secretary of State, has, has every intention, apparently, of implementing it, I don't understand. If the governor didn't give her authority to do it, I don't understand. Is that illegal? Is she an independent branch? She's not executive? Yeah, I no, she's, she's a constitutional officer. She's elected on her own right. So she was elected as Secretary of State. Uh, she's made this decision. Uh, the courts haven't stopped her. Uh, poll I saw today or yesterday says that 73 percent of the Michigan public agree with this decision. Well, well the courts, in fact, did stop her now. They, they did. did stop her. The federal, yeah. well, if the, a federal judge ruled on Friday that this was Friday? illegal, and today she said she would not appeal that. So she said she was going to try in subsequent elections, but for this year that's dead. Federal they, U.S. District Judge Paul Borman said that is illegal and you can't do that. He told the Secretary of State she could not do that. She could not force it. 
sub city clerks or, or town clerks. No, he said you can't do it. You just can't at do all. it. At all. Totally. This is not proper. This is a violation of the Equal Protection law Clause of the U.S. Constitution. Well, I'm glad you're here. You were working me that day. You were working that day. <laughs> Somebody's got to keep on top of these things. Uh, hi, this is Phyllis. I'm from Detroit. I have two questions. The first one, speaking of the courts, um, it's not necessarily related to the proposals, but the truth squad, do you have information about the judges? Because I'm always frustrated on trying to find out information about the judges. They're put in there for a long time. How do we find out if, you know, these judges are what they say they are? How do we get any information on them so we can make, you know, uh, a good decision when we vote? Good that's question. my first question. And my second one. Let's do one at a time. Okay. Rick? No, that's a, it's an excellent question. Um, I don't believe the Truth Squad has reviewed any of the state Supreme Court ads yet. I suspect they're in process at the moment. Um, there's, I think, six of us. Uh, that review these ads, and I'm not aware of all the assignments that have been made, but um, I'd be surprised if we're not working on on the Supreme Court ads uh, right now. I think so you're, are you asking about all the judges, though, not just yeah. Supreme Court? Yes. How do we? I think you know, she's asking what's in our local yeah. area, like for Detroit. How where do, where do you get information finish? on judicial candidates? What's the best place to go? Uh, that's a good question. I, I don't know that I can adequately answer that. I think League of Women Voters uh, guides are out there. Um, maybe you guys can help me yeah, out. So, uh, in some counties, the bar associations right. will rate judges, but not all counties. Um, yeah, it's tough. I mean, it's... The League of Women Voters asked all these folks to fill out a questionnaire. Some of them do. Most of them do, I think. Some of them don't. You can check with the bar association. Interestingly enough, not as an endorsement, but one of the candidates for Supreme Court, Bridget McCormick, says she wants an online one-stop shop where you can click on any judge candidate's name and see whether they have any violations, see what their education is. So it takes a little digging, and it's harder than for candidates. But generally, if you check with the League of Women Voters and the Bar Association, and maybe if you still have a daily newspaper in your town, maybe to check with and see not only who they're endorsing, but what their grounds are. Yeah, we've not seen a lot of ads for the judges, and part of that is because with all these proposals, all the TV ad time has been bought up, and the judges and many of the candidates don't have enough money because as they buy, well, Steve Schramm knows about this better than probably anybody in the room, the price goes up because greater demand, uh, finite supply, the prices go up, and some of these candidates just can't buy TV ads, and I, I suspect the Supreme Court justices are, are uh, candidates are some of them, and as far as the local judges, yeah, it, it, it's, you know, I've been, I've, I'm not as old as these guys, but, you know, I've been doing this since 1985, and even for reporters, finding out good background material on judicial candidates is really tough. Which is why the parties tend to nominate judges with Irish names. They're, they're, people tend to vote for whatever reason they trust judges with Irish names, so we, you may live to see a Supreme Court with seven Kellys on it. <laughs> And my second question, I don't know if you can even answer this one because it was a mess before the proposal. Um, proposal one with the emergency uh, finance manager. <laughs> if it fell or passes, how, or if it fails, how does it affect Detroit? Are we right back to the chaos before, you know, because we were trying to implement some kind of emergency manager? I don't know. I don't think that's real clear. Um, Lester. Yeah, I, I haven't covered that story. My colleague Sarah Swick is all over that story. As I recall from her reporting, uh, of course, you don't have a financial manager yet, yeah. and you had that agreement. Uh, and uh, as far as I know, that hasn't changed at all. It's just an agreement. Uh, so I don't think they've even taken the first real step in, uh, uh, in the process that gets to an emergency manager. Well, the uh, consent agreement was done to ward that off because right. they're on that they're on that path. They're on the path, but not but there. What, what's likely that it is almost certain. I, spe I do spend a lot of time paying attention to this. I had a long conversation with Mayor Bing uh, a month ago. It is almost certain that at some point Detroit will either be under an emergency manager or be in bankruptcy court. There's no alternative that anybody can see. So if the law is not clear. You're absolutely right. It sort of adds to the chaos. So this is going to be a continuing kind of sad drama that we're going to see playing out 
over the next months and years, I'm certain. And how it ends, I don't think any of us is going to know. Uh, hello. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you very much for this forum, by the way. I think it's very valuable. I guess the... Um, <laughs> The question that I had, and, and you sort of touched on this, if the emergency manager law is rejected, uh, and obviously this goes to a bankruptcy court, I know a lot of the unions uh, are in opposition to the emergency manager law, but it seems that the bankruptcy judge could just simply throw out all these contracts, and, and including pensions and everything else uh, uh, for cities or uh, public situations where there's a bankruptcy, uh, you know, I, I, maybe it's not a question so much as it's a comment in that, or if, if you can comment on it, any, anyone, uh, to uh, what is the preferred situation here? Uh, and I don't know how that helps these cities uh, solve their problem, get back, you know, back into a financially uh, sound footing. I, I, I asked this question, that, the last part of your question, of uh, the man who is now the emergency financial manager was the emergency manager in Benton Harbor, uh, Joe Harris. He had been the finance director of the city of Detroit. He said Wall Street likes it when the state takes over a city. They like the sort of emergency manager model. They don't like it when you go in the federal bankruptcy court. That's the only thing I have to base it on. That's what he told me. Rick, you may know something I don't. Well, I'm, um, I'm kind of racking my brain to uh, try to remember something about the – when a city goes into uh, bankruptcy, I think they call it Chapter 9. Uh, in the corporate world, it's Chapter you know, 7 or Chapter 11. Um, and I – you know, I, uh, maybe I shouldn't say this because I don't know this for sure, but uh, I, I was talking to a bankruptcy lawyer some time ago about Detroit and I believe he told me that bankruptcy judges under Chapter 9 do not necessarily have the power to eliminate uh, labor agreements. They do not. They do not Labor contracts. That's right. Um, and even, even in instances where they, they do, judges are often reluctant to do that unless it can be absolutely proven that that's, that's, that's needed for the entity to uh, survive. So... Um, I don't know if there's any good, <laughs> good solution to this, um, but it seems to me that if if there's continuing um, uncertainty over the emergency manager law, and uh, you know resulting litigation and all that, which which could end up happening, it seems like in a situation in Detroit, which is in really dire financial straits, that it could accelerate the move to bankruptcy, um, if if. If the uh, if there's you know if there's questions over the the um, the future of the emergency manager law, a little footnote: cities legally are creations of the state. The legislature could abolish Detroit. It could vote and it could break Detroit up into townships. It could compel the merger of Detroit and Wayne County. It could sort of do anything it wanted to as far as Detroit is concerned if it chose to do so. So there are all sorts. There are almost an infinite number of possibilities that could be played out. And Jack, doesn't the, um, the governor of the state also have to approve uh, the bankruptcy of the city? Yes. Well, as it now stands, the law is that the emergency manager, emergency financial manager, would have to be appointed first. At least that was the case under Public Act 4. I don't know if it's the case under the old emergency financial manager law, but they would have to make that recommendation to the governor who would have to approve it. So... Um, again, that we're in totally uncharted waters here. This has never happened in a major city. I'm not sure it has happened in any Michigan city. Does anyone, has that, does anyone know? So, so. But we're, we're, we've never had a situation like this before. And, you know, as Confucius didn't say, but he's, he's you know, the, he, supposedly Confucius said, the worst curse you give anybody is, may you live in interesting times, and we're definitely in interesting times. Uh, Jean Casey Ferndale. And I was just wondering, has any polling been done on any of these issues, and where do they stand? Yeah, uh, there has been a lot of polling. I can't give you precise numbers because I don't recall them because there are so darn many of them. But uh, the two-thirds majority uh, is passing by a pretty decent margin. 
Yep. Uh, the bridge is right just under 50%. It's there? a little behind. The bridge yeah. is a little behind. Uh, uh, do you call any of the other ones, Jack? Yeah, collective bargaining was a little bit ahead, but that was before the anticipation is the Chamber of Commerce is going to be launching a massive uh, advertising campaign against it if there's still ads they can buy. And the others, I don't know if there's been any polling on home health care or on the energy, uh, you know, and I yeah, would there, there, was on, there was on Prop yeah. 3, the energy, the, the 20 was, by 25, and that, uh, that, was, that was ahead. But I would distrust any polls because people have really, they're just now starting to engage with these things. Hello. Uh, my name is Roy Barnett, and I'm from Royal Oak. And uh, I think I may have more of, um, of a comment and a rhetorical question that you... Uh, gentlemen may be able to answer, and this might be driven by the fact that I've listened to too many uh, George Carlin albums and Jack <laughs> Lissenberry uh, commentaries, but um, I... The albums are better. <laughs> uh, yeah, but you're alive. Um, <laughs> uh, my, question, my question really is, uh, with so many people out tonight participating in our edification tonight. Um, have we, as the public ourselves, just become a little too complacent and too dependent on our uh, people in government to do the right thing for us? I mean, uh, to me, it seems that um, we, we, in our uh, complacency, we don't read enough, we don't listen enough. I mean. Do we need to enact a super PAC of our own to uh, supply, keep our, imp, our Michigan public radio? That's a brilliant question. I think Rick has a perfect answer for it. <laughs> uh, you know, I just, I, I feel that, um, you know, we need more forums like this. We need more people involved. Well, I know what I think, but these guys know something. So I want to, Rick, what do you think about that? No, I think you're right. I, I, I sense a complacency. Um, I also sense sort of a, uh, a, a cynicism and a, uh, just a deep distrust of government so that people are, 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 are rather than trying to reform it or, or get involved, they just turn away from it. Uh, that's the concern that, uh, that I have. I think the irony is we live in a time when more information is available to us than at any other time in history. Uh, and we trust less of it than we ever did in history. Um, you know, uh, this is not the first time we've had partisan media. Certainly in the uh, 19th century, the newspapers took sides and you had your partisan paper and you paid attention to it. That's happening again, but there's still um, some of us trying to be objective and trying to find the truth as we can. And, uh, and we're not trusted because we're deemed on one side of the political spectrum or the other. Uh, depending on what story we're covering that day. So it's out there. If you want to know, it's out there. We're trying to th synthesize it, uh, the Truth Squad and Jack and his commentaries and uh, me with my reporting and the rest of Michigan Radio are trying to do a good job of tr trying to get it down to uh, an understandable level that uh, gets through some of the BS that we saw up on the screen tonight and, uh, and tell you what's, what's what. But um, uh, it's all in who you trust to be your source of information if you trust anyone. And I think you're both right and totally wrong. And I'll tell you what you're right about. You're right about the fact that we can't be complacent, that we need more forums like this. We need to take responsibility for learning things. But on the other hand, our government's supposed to be a system of representative government. We elect people to make decisions for us. Maybe not decisions about um, whether we should have a progressive income tax, or maybe not about the bridge. but. I'm pretty well informed. I know nothing about agricultural policy. I don't have any idea what our agricultural policy should be, and I don't want to figure it out. I don't think I should be figuring it out. That's why you elect people in the legislature to go on the Agriculture Committee and figure this out. I have no idea what the Emmett County Road Commission should be spending, and I don't want and I don't think I should have to know that. And, and so we, I don't think we don't want to have Ross Perot, uh, who was nuts and ran for president 20 years ago, had this idea 
that we would all have, we would all vote every day with a little clicker on TV. You know, should there, you know, should there be a new stoplight on the corner of Maine and you know Houston? Should there, what are, should our policy toward North Korea be? That's frankly nuts. And and, and amending the Constitution to, in certain ways that should be handled by the legislature is a prescription for disaster. So, but you're absolutely right. We need to pay attention. And I am so impressed. Uh, we're out of time, and I'm going to hand this back over to Steve. But I'm so impressed that all of you came from people, places like Milford and Tecumseh, and even locally, to spend a perfectly good Tuesday evening watching three old white guys sit on a stage and talk about public policy. That warms the caucus of my heart. Thank you, and thank you again all for, uh, for coming. I think our panelists and Jack will be around for a couple minutes if you want to come up and ask them some questions directly. Uh, reminder, please uh, tip your wait staff. I want to thank uh, the great folks here at Mark Ridley's Comedy Castle for hosting our event tonight. Let's give them a round of applause, especially. And again, if you did not pick up one of the League of Women Voters ballot guides, those are at the door and some other Michigan Radio fee freebies, you can grab one. And uh, we hope that we'll see some of you at our next event, uh, election night, on uh, November 6th in Ann Arbor. Thank you.